please let's try to learn as much as we can. Great, thank you very much. Um, if you uh, want, to, I sent that outline out. I banged it out real quick. If you want to uh, follow along or if you want to take notes and it, just make your own copy uh, in Google Docs or copy paste, whatever it is that you do that works. I do want to thank uh, Nonprofit Builder for the opportunity to speak with you. It uh, is currently 4 a.m. in my time zone right now, which in a way kind of works well for me uh, because I have the circadian rhythms of a man in his 70s. Uh, but I will also add that my dad duties uh, don't begin for another couple of hours, but I'm also banking on the fact that on school days, my children only get out of bed under much duress. Uh, if for some reason a bleary-eyed child walks into the room, I thank you in advance for your, your understanding. Um, so uh, speaking of being a dad, a bit about me. I mentioned I have kids. I have three of them. My uh, oldest is 18 and she knows everything. My youngest is 12 and likes STEM and jiu-jitsu. And my middle child is excellent at esports uh, and aspires to a career where he has to work as little as possible. Um, that puts me at 43, which I just like to say because I am sometimes told I look younger than I am and I have been around for a little while. I got my start um, in the academy as a PhD student, later professor and a special instructor for some extra collegiate programs at Vanderbilt. Uh, later, I became an educational consultant, <clears throat> pardon me, well, for some of those same programs. Though they were uh, a part of Vanderbilt, they also had their own budgets, they had their own expenses, uh, they had to pay the university for things they wanted to use. So in many ways, it was like a small nonprofit within a very large institution. That sometimes would tell us things to do that weren't, you know, it's like, we can't do it that way, but we made it work. Um, my work there involved a lot of problem solving with limited resources. So um, to give you some a few examples uh, of, of the work there that I did and then also work that I continue to do now, one of the problems I encountered early on was people with master's degrees spending way too much time doing manual data entry because they were told that an online system would cost $50,000 in order to comply with the various requirements of the institution. Um, I figured out how to do it for like for zero dollars by using tools that were already out there and just needed to be put together. You know, later expanding it to include parent and teacher portals, develop technologies for managing students, camps, programs, cases, and constituents. Um, really before I had any idea what things like a, a CRM was, I just saw the need and I improved the system. Um, it was in that process that I saw how like a marginal change can have a huge impact so giving people just a little more time and a little more brain space tends to unleash a tremendous amount of energy, especially if those people are, uh, are mission driven and, um, and, and uh, sort of internally motivated and focused on, on getting great outcomes for their, their constituents. Um, I also saw what can happen when people take a one size fits all approach, which uh, you'll probably hear me say many times, I hate one size fits all approaches, I don't believe in them. Uh, there was a data breach, actually, not with us, but with another program, at which point the uh, university decided that actually all programs should work under the same, uh, same basic system. Um, now, our program's technologies uh, were more complicated and more advanced than, than some of the other programs that were, were using them uh, that were, were happening. Uh, so IT kind of wanted to work with us first to try to get a sense, like they said, if we can make it work for you, we can make it work for anyone. Um, so we spent about like a year in meetings trying to get things set up and it, it didn't work for us. <laughs> it never really worked for the other programs. Um, uh, IT was referring people to me and I was like, well, you can try this and this. We managed to find ways to make it work better, but we'd also had several years of experience using technology uh, to improve efficiency and efficacy and other programs didn't. I also heard that a couple of years later, um, after I'd left, uh, the university dropped that system and ended up going with something else, which means that that entire year of effort and meetings and all this work they put into it was wasted in, in part because they just didn't really listen um, or they didn't anticipate or appreciate what they didn't know. Well-intentioned, but there's a saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So um, I started uh, my own consulting company in January of 2020 because I have excellent timing. 
Uh, nonetheless, I've amassed a growing list of clients ranging from uh, San Francisco to South Africa. All of them are small. All of them have unique needs. That's kind of my niche, which means that most of them actually end up being nonprofits because I focus on cost-effective technologies for organizations that have operations and considerations that don't quite fit the mold. Um, that can often look like systems analysis and research, uh, helping to source and set up and deploy a solution, which is what I'll be talking about today. In some cases, custom application design uh, in FileMaker or Salesforce platforms or other low code platforms. Everything I do is customized. Like I said, I don't believe in one size fits all solutions. So that means that um, you know, if, if you're looking for me to say things like, if you're doing X, then you need Y product. But if you're doing A, you need B product. Um, I'm not really gonna do that. I can certainly talk about positives and negatives of systems I'm familiar with, uh, recognizing there will be some systems I'm not because there are always things coming out on the market. Um, but I rarely get into specifics until I really thoroughly understand the situation. So I'm happy to answer questions uh, you know, sort of about generalities and learn a little bit about the situation. But if I give any specific advice, just take it in advance with, with a grain of salt. Also, I've been told I do speak fast and if I go too fast, um, well, thankfully this is being recorded so you could watch it again at like 0.5 speed, but also feel free, um, uh, Anna, to kind of flag me or somebody to let me know if I need to slow down. Sure. Um, so let me do speak to some general trends actually uh, to kind of tell us why this is important, um, which means um, some of what I say, not all of it, but these are trends. Some of what I say uh, will probably apply to some of your organizations at least a little bit. One of those things that floors me every time, but I believe it when I think about like my own experiences is that they say 37% of software goes unused. And you see this a lot at organizations that have been around for a while. There's just kind of like this software creep that happens and they just keep paying licensing fees for things that people aren't actually using at all. Um, which means there's a good chance as an organization, you could be paying for things that nobody needs and nobody uses, um, which is essentially setting your money on fire. And by the way, speaking of data security, every application that's on the system is a possible point of breach. Uh, particularly if it's cloud-based, uh, so, you know, if it connects to anything. Um, so there's a good chance that not only could, could budget be wasted, but also, again, there's a door uh, there. 20%, um, that is how much time uh, is estimated people spend looking for internal information. Uh, I remember once, this one, my favorite memory, depending upon how you... Uh, how you think about it, but I did once sit in a 25, uh, for 25 minutes in an hour long meeting while people at the meeting tried to figure out what somebody who wasn't there had named a file that they needed to look at and reference in the meeting. The file ended up being named uh, PD19, obviously. Uh, so if you think about all the time you spend digging through emails, searching for documents, trying to access vital information that's locked away in the head of somebody who's out sick, um, you know, there's a lot of time that is just wasted there. Uh, one day per week per employee uh, is how much time uh, is lost doing mindless, repetitive tasks, tasks that could be automated. Um, I had a client uh, who needed a cost-effective way to have people do self-reporting of various activities in the community. They were, it was an environmental organization. They were doing like campaigns to improve the local area. And so there were points they could get for things like planting a tree or you know whatever whatever the case may be and when they'd done this in the past they had basically spent an hour a night taking data from a google form and then entering entering it into a spreadsheet and and some of you may already see a problem with that entering it into a spreadsheet and then posting it online as kind of like a leaderboard and they they wanted some help doing that they mentioned they were looking for a volunteer to help with that because that's just a lot of time and as soon as they heard i heard google form i went wait a minute hold on wait um you're using a google form for this at which point i spent about an hour of my time uh putting together some formulas that basically took the form submission turned it into a pivot table and sent that out to a chart that they could then display on their website uh, and that was updated whenever somebody submitted a form, it was in real time. So if you're thinking about the time that's lost there, right? This was a six week campaign. They were doing it five days a week, which means they spent about 30 hours for a person with a master's degree 
um, at a pretty high level, just entering Google Forms into spreadsheets, which was just insane. But again, I encountered this thing uh, a lot. And that was just like one thing I'm willing to bet that if I were hearing other situations and stories, there would be more of them. I encounter inefficiencies all the time. Uh, $11,000 uh, per employee is what's estimated to be lost in ineffective communication systems. So the back and forth that you have with email threads and documents that are the wrong version, it's not just annoying, it's costly. It cuts into your productivity. And uh, personnel costs are also generally your greatest costs. They're harder to see because there's not a balance statement necessarily at the end of the month, but uh, you can, so you can't see a, a line item for like how much you're losing in terms of your employee potential. Uh, but you can see a line item for a piece of software, which just means that it takes a little more work to figure out um, how that software might impact labor costs. Uh, one study, this one is my favorite, actually. One study asked, um, was your technology designed with the needs of your people in mind? And the, the findings were that 90% of the bosses, 90% of the executives said, yes, our technology was designed with the needs of our people in mind. 53% of frontline employees agreed with that statement, which means that nearly half of the people who were using the technology were like, no, this is just not working for us. And yet, the people in charge thought that, yeah, mostly it, it was. Which means, of course, if you're thinking things are bad, it's actually probably a little worse than that. 450%, uh, I believe this one, um, is how much more likely employees at technology laggard organizations are likely to quit. Uh, bad tech is not just an annoyance, it's actually like a soul killer, it's a spirit crusher. Um, I think there are a couple of reasons at play. Um, and I think this is especially true for nonprofits. And one of them is that people, um, especially younger people nowadays, they don't just work for the money, they work for meaning. They want to find meaning in what they do. Uh, it's a fundamental human drive. And if poor technologies are frustrating that fundamental search for meaning, then naturally I'm going to want to be drawn toward a place where I can have my meaning fulfilled. Um, especially if I've raised my concerns with my boss and nothing's happened. Uh, people need to feel heard, they need to find meaning in what they do. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think this does tend to probably affect uh, morale and retention. I will add though, if you're a little like me, um, being a, a person with an academic background, I look at these stats and I'm like, okay, wait, wait a minute, hold on. Some of this is industry research. And so I do feel you know, obliged to say, you know, maybe some of this has an angle, um, you know, maybe we should take it with a grain of salt. So as a thought experiment, what if we just took all of those numbers and say, yeah, okay, let's cut them in half, which instead of 37% of software going in use, that means you're, you know, setting 17% of your software budget on fire. Uh, instead of people spending 16 hours a week looking for internal info, they're only spending eight. Um, instead of one day a week per employee and tasks that could be automated, let's just say it's half a day per week per employee um, uh, or with vacation days, depending upon where you are, maybe like 18 weeks a year. Uh, the $11,000 one, let's cut that down to $5,000 loss per employee. Again, nice even number. Uh, I think the perception gap is probably closer to accurate, uh, but let's go ahead and just cut that down as well. So it's only 17% of our employees or nearly one in five are kind of more frustrated than you realize, uh, which means that uh, some of your best and most dedicated staff, uh, if you're at a technology laggard organization, maybe are only 225% uh, more likely to quit. So um, feel better about that, right? Uh, there's a lot more research out there. What I can tell you is that I wouldn't be in business if there wasn't a need. It's as simple as that. Uh, small organizations, especially small nonprofits, are losing quality, they're losing efficiency, and they're losing productive capacity because of ill-fitting or outdated technologies. So with that introduction out of the way, let me focus on what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about CRMs, and I'm not going to talk about CRMs. I'm going to talk about CRMs in the way that I might talk about Edgar Allan Poe if I wanted to teach you about American Gothic fiction. So I'm going to reference CRMs a lot as a kind of orienting point uh, that, because it's a thing that a lot of us are familiar with, uh, but I'm using the particular also to zoom out to the universal. 
because the principles of sorting and setting up and using one of these systems are basically the same across platforms. Uh, and the truth is they all kind of work the same way when you get right down to it. I'm not, again, I'm not really gonna talk about any particular product. I might mention something for illustration purposes. Um, but again, my true and sincere belief is that there's not just one good product for any single organization. Who you are, what you do is unique. So I'm not gonna give a treasure map or a decision tree here. There's just not a clear line. Uh, what I can do is give you some things to look for, think about, do and avoid doing. And so because of that, I'm gonna start with the fundamentals of how CRMs and other data management technologies work. I'm gonna get a bit nerdy, but I'm also gonna to try to be jargon light. So uh, if there are any software engineers or database designers in the room, please, when I get to this, the, this part, do not let your heads explode. Then I'm gonna talk about what you should do and what you, you should consider when you're looking for a CRM. And again, any data management technology. But getting the right application, again, is not enough. It's about using it. So you have to set things up in a way that will make it useful for your organization. Uh, the best technology when it's not set up well is basically the worst technology. And then I'm going to talk about strategies for adoption and deployment. Uh, so you bought this thing, you've set it up. How do you make sure you get your money's worth? How do you make sure you get the most uh, out of that investment so that it stays useful for a long, long, long time? So with that, let me talk about how CRMs work, any data management technology. Um, what a CRM is and thus um, how you use it depends a lot on whether you're a nonprofit or for-profit organization. If you are a for-profit organization, then CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management. It's software that helps a business manage relationships with their customers. So CRMs are basically about sales. A sales rep has a lead, they contact that lead, and the CRM helps them track all of the different steps in the process that are involved in converting a lead into a customer. Uh, and once that lead becomes a customer, then you want them to become a repeat customer. You want them to be a customer that sings your praises, that recommends you to others. So your CRM in that case might automatically put them into a campaign. It might do things like some happy birthday emails, whatever, whatever it is that you set up. Uh, and it also will help leaders make informed decision about how best to grow the business because those leaders are able to see all the data that has been captured in that CRM and make stronger strategic decisions about it. Um, it also will tell sales reps which businesses to prioritize because let's face it, some accounts you know, do have higher priority than others and they require different kinds of actions than others. Uh, and a CRM can help businesses identify priorities that might, admit, that might have been missed and take actions that are most likely to lead to long-term success. CRMs are also, um, they're very good at helping businesses be more efficient. They're very good at helping businesses improve customer service and provide valuable data for important decisions, which is why nonprofits started using them. And in many ways, a nonprofit CRM is a lot like a for-profit CRM. The C in nonprofit CRM stands for constituents. So you might think that a director of development can think of a constituent as a donor, which is like sales because a donor is a lead. The development director contacts the donor, tries to convert them, or the potential donor tries to convert them into an actual donor. And once they become a donor, the development director wants the action, wants to take actions that makes the donor into a loyal and frequent donor. And so, uh, and also as with business contacts, some donors require different responses than others. If I'm an individual who gives $50 a month, that is admirable, but if I'm an extremely charitable billionaire, um, you know, I might just want to handle the, my responses to those a little bit differently. Maybe, a, you know, the, the standard email isn't good enough. Maybe we need the development director to call directly and thank that person for their contribution. And a CRM helps you do that. So when it comes to donations, Nonprofit and for-profit CRMs are very similar, but that is kind of where the similarities end. Uh, there's overlap when it comes to money, some of it, not counting grants, can be some case management stuff that overlaps, but constituent for a nonprofit really is a much broader category. It could be a donor, uh, somebody who gives money. It can be a client, somebody who is in a way like the recipient of those money vis-a-vis -vis your, your services. It could be both. A constituent might be a volunteer who then starts to give. Uh, they might be a donor who starts to volunteer. They might be a client who ends up doing everything they can for your organization. 
constituent for nonprofit is not necessarily just one thing. Uh, I have a client who um, I, I, he was concerned that his, um, his online donation widget was not syncing up to Salesforce properly because he got this donation. It was like, it was just a dollar. And he's like, what? That can't be right. What's going on with this? And so I took a quick look at it and I was like, oh yeah, this is a person you guys helped out a few years ago uh, before he had joined. And uh, things are obviously still tight for that person, but they contributed a dollar. They wanted to contribute what they could because people who've been helped do feel gratitude and they do what they can. So you can go from being a client to a donor, a donor volunteer, client back again. It, it, all kinds of things get mixed up. Uh, and if my, you know, I, I checked my math on this and I asked a friend of mine yesterday, like to, who does, who's a mathematician, like, you know, what, what does this look like? I think there it looks like there's seven different things. And he said there are 15 different paths a person could take to get to any combination of those things I just laid out, which means, of course, there's not a sales pipeline. There are 15 pipelines, 15 journeys people are taking that are all very different. So a CRM, you know, with all due respect to for-profit CRMs, CRM for nonprofits, I find just to be more complicated. And for that reason, more fun, uh, which is also basically just the minimal stuff. You also have business and community partners, events that are a part of outreach, part fundraisers, government agencies, grant-making organizations, different reporting requirements, uh, not to mention the economic vulnerabilities and uncertainties that are unique to nonprofit organizations. Uh, grants are often renewed, renewed yearly. They can be pulled at the last minute. You're subject to the whims of various benefactors who believe you should be grateful, which of course you are, that they gave you the help they did. But it makes it hard to plan. You have less overhead typically, or you're, you're expected to operate with less overhead, which means when times get hard, you have to you know, figure things out pretty quickly, which means all, all of this means you basically need to be able to turn on a dime, to adapt very quickly to changing conditions, to take advantage of sudden opportunities, and to do it all with fewer staff, fewer resources, and a lot more uncertainty than anybody else. So you need a system that can manage all that variability, which gets us into the structure of the CRM or any system like it. Uh, what it is, how it works together. And this is the nerdy part. And so again, I think in advance people who are tech, um, the, the tech people for not letting their heads explode. Um, I said at the very beginning that these technologies, I mentioned that they all kind of work the same way. And here is why. Uh, no matter how advanced they are at their core, they are all just databases. And there are basically just three kinds of databases. They're flat databases, relational, and they're graph. I'm not going to talk about graph databases. Um, I've yet to encounter or think of a use case in which a nonprofit might use a graph database, but we're pretty familiar with the technology, actually. Um, a graph database is basically playing the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, where I try to find out how many steps it takes for me through people I know and they know to get to Kevin Bacon. So um, like when you are shopping on Amazon and it says, hey, you might be interested in this, or when Netflix says, you might try this movie, that's actually a graph database predicting your preferences based on you know, nodes and similarities between different data entities. But for the vast majority of data management purposes, we're talking about a flat and relational database in that order. A, a flat database, uh, is, the, is the foundation of the more sophisticated CRM stuff. And it is where most organizations start. And um, even organizations that have a consistent, uh, consistently use a sophisticated CRM, they will also use flat databases because a flat database is just a spreadsheet and spreadsheets have high utility. So I have a list of contacts in one spreadsheet here and I have a list of donations in another. Um, and this works. I, I've, I custom built the CRM I use uh, as part of my business, and I continue to use spreadsheets. They work really well at the beginning, and they work really well situationally. The problem is that they don't scale well, because as you grow relying on spreadsheets, and if you're pretty much only relying on spreadsheets, what happens, and I see this a lot, is that that's the, that system tends to start getting in the way of growth. Uh, so. Uh, let's say it's the end of the year, American nonprofits, uh, right now they have an upcoming deadline because of our weird tax system. Uh, nonprofits have to send letters to all of their donors acknowledging the sum total that they have given during the previous year so that then the donors are able to put that amount in their itemized deductions. Again, it's complicated, but what that basically means is that right now 
people need to be able to quickly look at their donor and know exactly how much they've given. If you have your information onto spreadsheets, then you have to sort through and you have to match up all the contacts and then all the gifts they've given. Uh, one person like doing that with, you know, three gifts, that's pretty easy. If you have two contacts and six gifts, that's pretty easy. Once you start having like 200 people giving gifts, that becomes harder uh, because the amount of work grows exponentially in proportion to your own success. The more people you, you have, the more work you have to do, the harder sorting through all that data become, becomes. It takes time, it takes attention, uh, it takes focus, and it gets in your own way. So um, if you're in charge of an organization, or if you're a highly qualified employee who's spending lots of time doing spreadsheet work, which again, like I see, um, then the more you grow, what ends up happening is the less time you have to do the things that help you grow. Uh, but a database that can recognize relationships, that can see them, that can act on them, that is what a CRN is and what it does. So without you having to do anything more than a push of a button, it gets you the information you need which gets us to uh, the second kind of database, the relational one, which pretty much all CRMs are. So going back to the donation matching, the spreadsheet you have, um, what if everything could just do the matching for you? A relational database is able to connect spreadsheets together. So like John Smith and your contacts. And uh, if you, you, know, you go to your contact sheet and immediately you click on John Smith and immediately a new spreadsheet opens showing only the donations for John Smith. That's kind of how the relational databases work, which means that if I'm in one spreadsheet, you know how I can look at a column and say sum in one spreadsheet. If I have a relational database, I can then do it across spreadsheets. I don't just have to sum up my rows in one spreadsheet and then switch back and forth between them. There's a connection. I can see and manipulate data in it. And I can organize those data points in lots of different ways. Um, so in this example, Let's say I want to find out where, if where a person works has any relationship to how much they give. Uh, I can see that John Smith and I can see that Bob Bobbery both work at company X. I can see very quickly in my organization spreadsheet that they've both given a combined total of 500. I can see that the people who work at company X give more and that they give more frequently. Um, for example purposes, this doesn't tell me a lot. It's a very small data set. But if I had more data sets, but I have more data points, what I could do is then um, learn, uh, uh, I could look at my contacts and begin to see larger trends and patterns. So I could see, well, maybe if company X has more people and they give more often, then maybe I might have better luck getting them to sponsor an event. Or wait, company Y does matching gifts? Maybe that's an area where I should try, start trying to boost things up a little bit. Uh, you know, sort of saying knowledge is power, which means the more knowledge you have, the more your ability to access it, the more you are empowered as an organization to make the kind of difference you truly want to make which is why I said at the beginning that these technologies all sort of work the same way. They're just spreadsheets with different titles, different columns, and different kinds of connections. It can be a constituent management system with contacts, organizations, and donors. It can be a student management system with classes, students, and teachers, learning management with courses, units, and lessons, case management with children's families and visits, uh, even like a direct mail system, contacts, campaigns, emails, clicks, opens. Um, you could even have a massive system that like combined all of those things into one. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the flexibility that you have to customize it to work for you the way that you need it to work and to track the kind of information you need to track. So how does this help? Well, uh, this information is really all about people, uh, freeing up their time and their energy and their uh, creative potential because there's no greater resource at an organization than well-qualified staff. So the difference this makes is that it allows people to do the things they are best at, the best at. The thing we need to remember about computers is that they are dumb. Computers are dumb. Yes, there's AI. Yes, they've gotten faster. Yes, they can hold and process more data, but by and large, they're still dumb. If you've ever had to click on one of those pictures to prove you're not a robot, like find all the school buses, you, you know that sometimes an AI has a hard time telling a school bus apart from a freight train, which means that a three-year-old is smarter than that AI. What computers are is fast. They can do complex math equations much faster than any human ever could. Uh, they will do it perfectly every time. No, they cannot infer meaning. They can only follow instructions and whether those instructions are good or bad, they will execute them perfectly every time. Uh, if you took a computer and you 
um, like put it into a human body and you said, you know, take a shower, wash your hair, just follow the instructions on the bottle, the computer would never actually leave the shower because the instructions say wash, rinse, and repeat. Uh, we humans who can infer meaning recognize that that means like maybe once or twice, uh, the computer will just keep doing that. So that's why I say they're, they're perfect in the sense that they will follow your instructions perfectly every time, whether those instructions are good and be or bad, they will follow them, which means if you can get them to be good, then you have a system that is working very quickly and very efficiently for you. Because humans are not perfect. Uh, we make mistakes, we get distracted, we miss steps, we're slow. Um, computers will always do math faster than we can. So the upshot of this is, if we can get the computer to do the things that we're bad at through a CRM, then there's a lot more time we have to do the things we're good at because unlike computers, we're smart. We can infer meaning, we can use judgment, we can learn from our experiences. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, when you're a small organization, we have more time to be creative. So the benefit here is that using a CRM and the relational data structure within it uh, will allow a computer to do the things that it's good at and people to do the things that they're good at. Uh, those calculations, if we try to do them some and then select and then copy and pay all of that stuff, we're gonna, it's gonna take us a long time and we're gonna make mistakes. But if we have the data in front of us and can access it quickly, then we can make intelligent decisions. We can respond more quickly and creatively to changing circumstances because efficiency here, it's all about allocation of resources. Um, computers do think when computers do things that we're slow at, then we have more resources in terms of our human power. Compute when computers catch a mistake, our service improves. When we have more brain space, we can be more creative. Um, in a spreadsheet, in a flat database, the more data you have, the harder it is to grow. But in a relational database, it's actually the opposite because you have more data, which makes you more informed, and that makes your decisions um, uh, that makes your decisions more powerful. I will say though, in the, in, in the enthusiasm, I do wanna issue a caution because when some organizations start moving toward a CRM, there is a, an adjustment period um, because people will still have to do things like data entry. And if your organization doesn't do a great job at collecting data now, if important information tends to live in people's heads or on their hard drives, uh, then your people will probably have to do more data entry than they would right now, which requires a culture shift. And on the front end, there can be some grumbling, like, why am I tracking this? But the payout comes on the other side, uh, which is all just a way of saying the, the way people spend their time and energy might shift. But um, once the benefit becomes obvious, then they'll get on board. Unless, of course, you get the wrong system, which brings me to the matter of sourcing. So for this part of the presentation, I'm going to cover three things involved in sourcing um, the acquisition process, finding out what product you should get. Um, the process you can take once you decide to get a, a CRM or a new CRM, uh, the types of products out there and the criteria you use to help you decide what to get, uh, and then also the, the pricing, which is a big one I know. Uh, but it's, um, it's not necessarily what should be the only determining factor. So, when you're sourcing, step one is to assemble a team. This is not something that should be handled by one, by one person for the simple reason that one person does not know everything that you need to know. They don't know everything that everybody does at the organization. And ultimately what the system needs to be about is taking those relational entities that you have in real life and being able to represent them um, on a computer screen. And so if they don't have the big picture, then it's hard to get the system that is needed. So yes, you need management who can have that big picture, but really you need to also pull in frontline staff into that team. Um, here, it might be useful to remember again, the perception gap that I mentioned earlier between what bosses and employees think they need in a CRM. If you involve frontline people um, who will actually be using the software, then uh, you have a higher chance of picking something that works for everybody. But I, and if you don't have them, you have a higher chance of picking something bad. And even if you pick something good uh, and the people who use the software feel cut out of the process, then you may face a lot more resistance when it comes to actually getting them to use it. So rightly or wrongly, if you don't have frontline buy-in, um, it's not gonna work as well. So um, 
you need to make sure that's on the team. And then I mentioned management. Um, you know, you want somebody there who can keep, who can take the big picture. Uh, in terms of like executives, like very top folks, definitely keep them informed. I don't recommend that they spend a lot of their time like working on this team, maybe just sort of gently move them over because uh, they have a bird's eye view, but depending again, like on um, how structured your organization is, right? If it's lots of levels, then um, an executive can have maybe too much of a bird's eye view. They can get, uh, they can let what they, they, they used to be the case. If they came up through the organization, they can let what's expected um, influence too much of what they think people need now. I'll give you an example. I recently did a custom build for somebody and uh, the executive gave me a long list of everything that needed to be in, uh, in the solution in the, um, uh, it was a, um, it was a subscription tracking system. He knew exactly what it wanted to be. He broke it up into a very specific list of requirements, which I then put together per his instructions. And once people started using it, I had to go back and change a lot of things because those requirements were not actually what were required when people needed to do their jobs, when they needed to like, here are the steps I took to get things done. So the higher you are, the harder it is to see the details. Um, and finally, you do need tech on the team. You need somebody who knows technology, uh, ideally, this would be somebody with nonprofit experience uh, or experience working with small organizations, uh, a person who only has experience at a large corporation, they, they can bring a business mindset into the CRM and it can be hard to shake off that mindset when it comes to your needs as a nonprofit. Which brings us to step two, gather information. I don't mean market research yet. Don't do market research yet. Start with your people, your staff do surveys, um, do the surveys and make them focused not on technology actually, but how people spend their time. Rank order the tasks in terms of frustration level, um, you know, do an inventory of all the technologies they use because chances are they're using things that you don't know about. I think um, it's like, it's somewhere close to 20%. It's one of the other research things about 20% of people, um, employees download unauthorized or unapproved software security issue um, to get their work done. So get a sense of what it is they use and, and but, but not in terms of like features of like what tools they use when they're doing their job. Um, but it's also actually not enough just to like send out surveys. Uh, Simon Sinek uh, has this famous TED talk where he, he says, start with why. Uh, you know, why is it that you're using this thing? Why is it that you're doing what you're doing? So I like focus groups. They, they just give you richer information um, surveys like quantitative information can, you know, skim a wide surface, but just to having a conversation with people is going to show you depths you hadn't known or considered. Uh, try to get stories really above all. Uh, I like to ask, tell me about a time when something took longer than it should have. Tell me about a time when uh, an avoidable mistake wasn't avoided. Usually you can find the holes there. Tell me about your choke points. Like what is the thing that when there's a process happening, everything gets backed up on it? What, what's going on there? Again, it's trying to get a picture of the process. Um, quick aside, make sure your focus groups um, are led by peers. You, you know, it's, if you have a boss standing in front of the, the frontline staff, so what don't you like? You're not necessarily gonna get the, the most frank answers. At this point, I would actually say, again, don't involve the tech person. I say this is a tech person. Uh, they don't even need to be doing market research yet because what you don't wanna do is prejudice um, uh, the feedback you get and how you interpret that feedback by bringing in systems you've already been looking about and thinking about. You really want to let the stories people tell you drive the process at this point. And once you have those stories assembled, then you want to come together and identify not a list of features people want, right? Uh, like I want to be able to send email reminders. No, uh, you want to list the needs that need to be met. So um, if somebody says, uh, they have to enter too many things on a page. You know, you don't put fewer fields on the page, fewer boxes, less information to enter. Um, you could put um, faster data entry, right? That's a need people have. Um, and when you put faster data entry, rather than fewer fields, right? Fewer fields means like this is a specific thing, but when you put faster data entry, there's lots of ways to address that. It could be a cleaner UI, could be automations, could be just tab order. Um, you know, or the ability to customize 
or view roles by employee type. So again, the goal is not to constrain the imagination. Um, I often hear clients say, um, we'd like this thing to do email reminders. Do you, uh, do you really want more things in your inbox? Or is that you don't want things to fall through the cracks, that you want to make sure that that thing happens every time this thing happens? Uh, an email reminder can do that, but so could push notifications, task lists, summary dashboards that people see. There are lots of ways to make sure something doesn't fall through the crack. And we're, again, we're trying to keep our options open. Uh, management on the team, is prob they're probably going to have more specific reporting needs. Uh, those just tend to be more specific every three months. I need this. Um, so, you know, you can think in terms of like what I need to show, but it's also good to think in terms of what I need to know or what I'd like to know. Uh, I'd like to know if sending people emails has any effect on giving or has any relationship to giving. I'd like to know what kinds of things younger people volunteer for versus older people. Uh, you know, having that information that, that you're able to access not only gives you the specific things, but it also sets you up to be able to, to, to adjust as conditions change. Once those needs are listed, then the role of the tech person is to start putting together options. Obviously, other people can start putting together options, but, you know, the role at that point, um, this is where things can be kind of, they can slow down a little bit because you're going to need to sign up for some free trials. You're going to have to sit through some sales pitches. You need to, tell, uh, to demo and test drive things. Um, at this point, you're also going to start to notice price, and you definitely should notice price. Uh, you should make sure you list the price. You should make sure you know the price every time. Uh, if somebody's cagey about a price, just, you know, I, I, that's a red flag for me. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily fixate on the price because, um, well, here's why. So all products that you get lie somewhere on a continuum between a managed product and a custom product. The closer you get to custom generally, the higher the sticker price gets. So on the, on the one end, when you think about a managed product, you can think about like a Fisher Price Playhouse. It's mass produced, which makes it cheaper, um, which means also that you can only really use it in the way that it's been set up to use. You can put the people in different rooms, but um, you know, if you have a three story, if you need a three story playhouse, you're not gonna get it with the Fisher Price one. On the other hand, uh, you could have a big box of Legos. These are actual prices, by the way. Huge box of Legos with bricks. You can move around any way you want and get pretty much anything you need. Let's say you have something like a Lego Duplo set in the middle. Some customization, but a lot of it's fixed. Now, uh, the temptation, and I fall prey to this, like what's cheapest? Uh, that's where I'm at. So we, we tend to want to get as close to manage as possible. Uh, which is kind of actually what I recommend. Managed products are great. Um, I use managed products. Um, but just recognize that, you know, you don't want to get a product that's going to constrain you. In the same way, I love custom systems. I build custom systems. But a custom system, uh, even if a service doesn't cost very much, you still need somebody to put it together. And there can be more of an investment in time and resources than you anticipate at the beginning. So what I recommend is... Um, well, let me back up. In terms of actual product comparison, here are just two examples in, of extremes that I've seen. On the one hand, Apricot 360, which does case management software, uh, not to be confused with all Apricot. Um, you know, it's very much like the Fisher Price Playhouse, which means it does some very specific things very, very well. Um, but there's not a lot you can adjust. I mean, even like the color scheme, you can choose a green color scheme or a black and white color screen, scheme, and that's it. On the other end, you do have Salesforce, which uh, started at the managed end. And so there's still some things that fix that are fixed, but uh, really has some powerful features that means you can kind of make it do anything you want. So it really is on the far end of the, of the customized. It's also very, very expensive, unless you're a nonprofit, in which case it's free, uh, but a word of caution. Uh, I only recommend Salesforce to nonprofits about 10% of the time. So I will say, um, I, I often will talk to nonprofits who use Salesforce and I got, we're attracted to it because of the price tag. But what ends up happening is it is such a big system and with such a big learning curve, it becomes frustrating and it can take more time. Uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, it was, it was, it's, been a, it's been a little while, but I spoke with an organization where somebody, I'm not gonna remember the specifics, uh, they were exporting all of the giving for a month 
and then creating a mail merge using Excel and um, and like printing off letters or something kind of ridiculous uh, because they just didn't know that you could like set Salesforce up to do that because again it's really really big. Um, so I'll also add by the way that I do talk to nonprofits who end up like they get free Salesforce but then they end up paying a lot for developers to configure and maintain it for them. So when you think about price, remember that there's a difference between the sticker price and the actual price, which involves humans doing the things humans are good at and computers doing the things computers are good at. So apart from just managed and custom, when it comes to thinking about price, we actually have more of a, of a grid here. We wanna think about power. What can the system do? That needs to be a factor when we think about price. Uh, something that is high cost but really improves productivity is, potentially gonna be cheaper on the whole than something that is low cost, but with low utility. Uh, so at the bottom left, we clearly don't want that, right? You don't want a system that cannot be customized and requires a lot of human input. Uh, in the top right, a powerful and fully customized system is gonna get you the greatest utility and greatest efficiency, but it might also have um, a high sticker price. Uh, it's gonna come with development costs. So, uh, and a lot of that will depend on how well you configure it. So just keep that in mind high utility, higher cost, but maybe, you know, a better investment. Uh, as for the other two things, something very customizable, but that requires a lot of human input or not very customizable, but is very powerful. Which of those things might uh, work best is really use case dependent. So managed products are cheaper. Uh, when considering a CRM, I, I say start with the managed products, look at all of its features and compare all of those features to all of the needs that you put together on that list. Uh, do we have a feature here that can, in this product that can meet a need there? If yes, check it off. And keep doing that until you get to 95%. That's my 95% rule. If any product falls short of meeting 95% of the things on that list, move on. Uh, because anything you save in price on the front end but with by like, like matching 85%, you're just gonna lose the money on the, on the, on down the road, right? The goal is efficiency. The goal is to empower people. The system needs to, to do the things that humans don't do well. So you're only really gonna hit that payoff when you hit around 95% of those things. Uh, what often I'll see happen is uh, somebody will go with the cheaper 85% and then two years later, they'll be like, no, that doesn't work. And then they'll end up getting the more expensive thing down the line anyway, except they've lost the trust of their people um, they've wasted already time and money that could have been better invested. So just think about that when you think of price. Uh, if you don't follow the 95% rule, you're going to get, uh, you won't get the productivity gains. People won't really use it. Adoption will be a huge problem, in which case you're paying for something that only meets 80% of your needs and uh, that only 20% of your people use. What tends to happen is people find other methods uh, when they don't get a lot of utility out of it. Uh, and you'll also like often end up buying things a couple of years later that uh, you could have just bought the first time. Um, so in terms of, of, of the price, do definitely think about your budget. Yes, think about a number, but don't get hung up on the number. Don't just think short term. Short term savings now could be long term expenses later, right? If I buy a car that gets 20 kilometers per gallon, might be a cheap car, but the costs add up. Um, and also remember earlier when I mentioned that so that, to go back to that research, I, I mentioned that like 16% is estimated uh, that people spend looking for internal info. We made that like, um, sorry, 16 hours. We made that eight hours. Let's just imagine maybe people spend, am I doing the math right? They said they, we, we made the 20%, 10%. So uh, if you have a team of five people working 40 hours, some of them are hourly, some hourly, some of them are salaried. So let's say if we average that to 20%, like $20 an hour, maybe something cheap, um, so 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, $20 an hour. If they spend 10% of their work week just looking for internal information, uh, the inefficiency is going to cost the organization uh, four times 20 times 52, which is $4,160. And when you multiply that by five people, it's $20,800. But if you can cut that down by just one hour, right? If you can just get a little more efficiency out of there, um, so that they're only spending like three hours a week looking up internal info, um, then it's three times 20 times 52 equals 3,120. Multiplied by five employees, that gets you $15,600. So you subtract that from 20,800 and now you have a little over $5,000.
So that new system could still cost $5,000 more than you were originally planning to spend, and you would still come out ahead. The numbers are harder to see. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to make that kind of one-to-one -one relationship. Some of it's subjective. You know, it doesn't mean you now have $5,000 more to spend on your CRM. Uh, but it means you might be open to spending $2,000 more, right? So you can think about how the, the sticker price and the actual productivity costs interact with each other when you're considering that frame of options. If you can't find anything that meets the 95% rule, if you can't find a CRM that does that, don't get a CRM. Uh, it'll be a terrible investment. Find other ways to gain efficiency um, until you're able to get to a point where you can invest in a, in a bigger system. And now set up. Uh, once you have a product, you're getting it ready. So uh, this is where you need to take a lot of care. Getting the right system is really important. So the sourcing process is vital. But if you get the right system and you set it up poorly, it's just like getting a bad system. It's not going to work. So I'm going to give you five rules for setting up a new system, five rules, which are things you should generally always probably do. Um, if you don't break the rules and you uh, keep them in mind, you have a higher chance of success of successfully deploying something. And rule number one is that data needs to always look like life. What you have in the system needs to look like the real world. So if we pretend I'm a nonprofit that provides after-school programs for at-risk youth, a new participant comes in, you have the parent fill out a form that asks for some basic info. When setting up a CRM, the tendency is just to reproduce this form on a layout, uh, which is not a great idea. You might have the layout look like this form, but you need to pay attention to what's happening in, in the boxes behind the scenes. Uh, so let me just give you a simple example too, in terms of data looking like life. Um, it, in organizations that have been around for a while, you will often see father and mother listed as, as options when families don't really look like that uh, as much anymore. Uh, so, you know, this is a good time to actually also look at your old methods of doing things and update them as well uh, when you're getting ready to transition to something. Um, now, if I were to create uh, all of this in a CRM as is, right, so if I were just to, to take this form and then slap it into a CRM, tracking data is going to be difficult to track. It's, it's going to be hard to do. Entering it is going to be familiar. But tracking it and getting the information you need quickly is going to be much more complicated. So let's say I have a grant application and that grant, um, I need to know how many children come from single parent homes. I have a thousand applications to go through. If I don't have the ability to produce that information at the push of a button, uh, you know, with everything I've got going on, I might just not fill out the grant or I might miss the deadline. And that's a real loss opportunity. If all I have is these forms, I have to do a lot of manual stuff to try to figure out which one has, you know, just one, one parent, you know, um, maybe or effectively if they have, if they have effectively one parent, like maybe it's a divorced family or there's an estrangement going on, but the father's information is still on there, but there's not interaction happening. So like, again, it's, if I just have things set up this way, I don't have the kind of granular, infor granular information I need, <clears throat> excuse me. I need at my disposal very quickly. Um, but what if I want to chart, like, or, or to give you another example, let's say I want to chart over time the schools that participants have come from over the years, see if there are any patterns. Again, I could do that with the spreadsheet, but it's going to take a while. Making your data look like life means to think about all the different segments of these forms and how they connect to the spreadsheets that are happening uh, behind the scenes. So I'm gonna circle back around at this point in a second, but this does get us actually to rule two, which is um, you need to be able to get your answers in under 10 minutes. If the data you have do not look like the way life works, like the way you operate, then uh, it's gonna take you longer than you need to get the information you want. And so if it takes more than 10 minutes to get that information as you're setting things up, recognize that there might be a fund fundamental setup process problem. Or if you're takes you more than 10 minutes to get what you need now, there could be a fundamental setup problem. So back to the participant form. Um, the things I naturally segment on this form are telling me what spreadsheets I need um, and how they could be linked together. So while I don't necessarily want to just slap this on a page, the segments here do tell me how I need to think about those different connections that 
should look like the life of the people in my organization. So to go back to this slide, right? Uh, the count and the sum columns are doing the sort of formulas that you might be used to in a single spreadsheet, but they're doing it in a related spreadsheet. So uh, what if I wanna count how many participants came from each school? Well, if I wanna do that, then I need to actually have a school spreadsheet, right? And it needs to be linked to a child spreadsheet so I can do uh, the count of those numbers. And when I have my spreadsheet set up this way, I can be at the school and look across and see, oh, here are the list of all the participants. And then I can figure out very quickly how many eight-year-olds came from that school. What about the number of nine-year-olds? I can find the average age of the child sent to us, right? I can run all those formulas and calculations that I would normally do in one spreadsheet, but I can run it across and see how that information is connected very quickly. I can do it instantly, basically with the push of a button. Um, I'm gonna make sure, I'm gonna kind of skip this example because I wanna make sure that we, we do have enough time. Uh, so let me just, okay. So I mentioned the parent guardian info, right? So if you had um, children and parents, instead of having them like just on one single spreadsheet, right? What I'll often see is like child, and then at the top will be parent, parent contact rate information, right? If I have all of that set up like in a flat spreadsheet, it's not gonna have as much useful information. Um, I'm gonna have a hard time like figuring out which children belong to which parent if there are siblings. But if I have those in two different places, then I can very quickly see this parent has three kids and here they are. So in terms of architecture, if you're looking at the back end of it, the CRM will start to look a little bit like this. Um, you know, you have a child and they're connected to the parent, though actually um, doing it this way would probably be a bit better. So I have a family, I have an entity called a family, a spreadsheet called a family, and that's where I put things like address in a column, a primary contact column, an emergency contact column, and it's where I put all my calculations that I'm going to run because I want to be able to see things very quickly, you know, in terms of people who are connected to the family. Uh, parents is maybe where I'll store things like phone information. I might have a checkbox saying, are you the custodial contact? Child is where I'll store things like date of birth, school, current grade. Because uh, school is related, I need to put that connection in there as well. So I need to make sure that um, I, I think about how that relationship is going to be set up. Um, I also need to think about not you know, like life, right? I need to be thinking about how, um, how I'm going to use these things. So there are two basic questions you can ask when you are trying to decide whether something on a form needs to be like its own spreadsheet or needs to be um, just kind of in a flat spreadsheet. So you need a related spreadsheet. You need a relationship under two conditions normally. The first one being, do I need to count this? The second one being, do I need to track this? And, and maybe the question should actually be, might I need to count this? Might I need to track it? You, you may not need it now, but you might later. If you answer either one of those questions with yes, then it affects, again, how you set things up. Um, so we talked about counting. Uh, we talked about kids in the family. Let's think about tracking, right? Uh, I have a client right now who works um, in, a, in a social services situation, and so she often has to uh, present records in, in court cases. And one of the things that, that they need is the ability to show where a child lived during a period of service, because the families often move a lot. And so they need to track addresses. If I'm just using, again, like a flat sheet, which is a problem they have now, or a problem they've had, um, then I have to like, I, I, I end up having to like scrawl notes or make comments or something, some kind of way to make, make sure that that address information is in there. Whereas um, if I need to track addresses uh, in a CRM or a case management system, then instead of storing it in a family, I'm actually gonna just relate it to the family. It's gonna be its own sheet. Um, or if I have a, a situation where a child enrolls in something year after year, I need to track that. So enrollments would need to be its own spreadsheet. Um, I need to be able to show, um, you know, the schools that kids were in. Uh, enrollments, um, I often need documents to be signed. I need to track that. So we'll put that in there. Uh, for quality purposes, I want to track emails. Um, I send phone calls I make. So I make a note spreadsheet. And uh, a note could be related to a parent, to the family, to the child. So I want to make all those connections. Um, I need to be able to count how many students have attended which school. Um, oh, programs. Um, maybe there are, are 
enrollments that work differently. Like every program has its own unique system. So I got to add that in there. Um, and I got to make sure I count uh, how many children participate in each program. There's more because there's like the financial stuff, right? Which connects to all sorts of things. Um, volunteers, right? You've got to track them, all that stuff. So at this point, what I'm doing with this pretty complicated system is I'm putting in all the parts of the organization. I'm extracting all of the different groups of constituents I work with and the things related to them. And I'm designing my system in a way that, um, you know, uh, uh, allows me to put those things in different boxes, but still have them all be able to connect to each other, which means that if I configure it one way, I can also configure it another way. It adds some flexibility. So like to give you a more typical example for a, a CRM, let's say we're using a CRM for fundraising and to manage events. Um, things are a bit simpler, there are fewer arrows, but I can still use those arrows to easily track and, and quickly analyze my information. So if I have a campaign for a certain event, um, or if I want to track contacts for that campaign, I have to set up a kind of intermediary thing. We don't need to worry about that, or I might, have an event where I need volunteers and my volunteers work different shifts. Um, I bring in certain amounts of revenue from the event, which also gives me some information about my ROI, my return on investment. If I'm having things that are connected, I can get that information pretty quickly. And I have enough flexibility to be able to, if, I, if something changes, to move things around and, and get it in different ways. Which brings us to rule three. Um, let me summarize rule one, just as a reminder, data should look like life. Rule two, it should take 10 minutes or less to find something. Those two rules are really about structure when you're setting up a system. Um, now we're gonna talk more about speed and the overall user experience. That's what rule three is about. Um, every one of the arrows I showed you is something that can happen automatically at the push of a button. It's also a potential liability if it's overused. So that is why rule three is if you don't need it, need it don't ask for it. All these connections here, they come with upsides and they come with downsides. The uh, upside is data analysis and flexibility. We've already covered that. The downside potentially is speed, which is essential to a positive user experience. Um, it's generally faster for a computer to look up something in, its, in a single spreadsheet. Uh, that speed difference is negligible in a well set up system. It takes a little bit longer to look across spreadsheets, but, but not noticeable unless you go crazy with the arrows. All that that sweet, sweet data analysis can make, make it really tempting to like start getting more information, making more connections than you need. The problem is that the deeper those connections go, the more connections you have, that puts a burden on the system. Um, I see this sometimes when I come across uh, systems with contact information, somebody got a little too eager. A person could have an infinite number of phone numbers. So maybe instead of like on a spreadsheet, you might have phone one and phone two as two separate columns. They're like, let's make a new spreadsheet for phone numbers and relate that to contacts. Do you, do you need to do that? Um, okay, yes, you could do it that way, but do you need more than two numbers? No, then don't ask for more than two numbers. Or I see this with volunteer availability as well. An organization will ask volunteers to like put all the times they're available. Then they'll, their staff will put that availability into their CRM. And then when they need a volunteer, they just send an email blast out to everyone. All right? They've asked for that information from volunteers, they've entered it in the system and they just don't use it. Um, the temptation makes sense to me. Uh, my mother always says, and I always repeat, it's better to have something and not need it than to need something and not have it, except when you're setting up a CRM. Uh, asking for information you don't need will annoy your constituents, it'll slow down your staff and it's gonna slow down the system. But if you set it up right, uh, you will set it up so that you only get the information you need right now, but you can get information you might not know you need yet. And you can add things as you go. Which brings us to rule four. Um, rule three was about speed, which, which affects the user experience. Rule four is about the interface, the UI, which is again, part of the user experience. And this one's pretty simple. Never underestimate the power of not hating something. Uh, if you'd asked me a few years ago how important like design and interface are, I would have kind of said it's secondary, like it's kind of superficial. Then I had the opportunity to teach some, um, uh, some, some philosophy classes at a design college. And I learned that, that yes, while there's a bit of subjectivity to this, there are also some general like triggers that affect the way 
people respond to spaces that they're in or things they see. It's, it is subjective, but it's predictably subjective. Um, the space we're in organizes, it affects um, how we carry ourselves, how quietly we speak, how fast we move, and that affects, that includes digital spaces as well. <clears throat> so when you're thinking about design and a system that is well designed, um, this, the, the elevator buttons on the right are a particularly bad example. Uh, like that's particularly egregious, but it's it's a good thought experiment because when I think about what it would be like to ride that elevator, I'm immediately frustrated and overwhelmed. It's gonna take me a long time to figure out which button to push. I'm likely to push the wrong one, end up on the wrong floor. Um, God forbid I should have to teach somebody else how to use this elevator. That's gonna take me a while. I'm gonna be grumbling while I do it. I'm not excited to use it. They're not excited to use it. When you're setting up um, the CRM, kind of the same thing applies, right? If people don't enjoy using it, if it's too complex, they're gonna find it frustrating and overwhelming. They'll push the wrong buttons. They'll make more mistakes. Training somebody is gonna take longer. People will avoid using it. Um, I, if I had to use this elevator and there was another elevator on the other side of the building that required me to go outside the building and walk through the snow or rain to get to that other elevator, I probably would do that. People will actually work harder to avoid something they find unpleasant. So the reason not to underestimate the importance of not hating something is that people will avoid what they hate, which means you will buy the CRM and then people will start using their Google Sheets on the side, which brings you back to the same problems you had before. <clears throat> when you're setting up an interface, there are a number of things that you need to pay attention to. I'm going to kind of work through these fairly quickly. Um, I will mention, though, like one of the most important ones is actually aesthetics. Uh, and it, that seems a bit shallow, right? If you're looking at a CRM and people say, that's just ugly, I just don't like it. Um, again, that might seem a little superficial, but listen to them. Uh, for one, it's just a fact. Whether or not it's ugly is not a fact, but that they feel like it's ugly, that um, is a fact. And if they feel like it's ugly, then they're not going to enjoy that experience. Um, it also says something about the priorities of the, the vendor, the, the developer, right? Whether or not they're thinking a lot about the user interface. Um, navigation, it should be obvious to get from point A to point B. Um, process, how many steps are involved in adding a new contact? Is adding the contact process very similar to the or adding an organization process so that learning how to do one means it's easier to learn how to do the other? Do I have to enter a lot of data by hand? Do I have to move and click the mouse 12 times? Uh, et cetera, which is number five, minimizing user inputs. Uh, every time a user clicks on something, every time they have to type something, that is an opportunity for them to make a mistake, it slows them down, it introduces errors. Uh, so when you're setting up a system, there are a few things you can do to minimize uh, those errors or if uh, to minimize the user inputs, or if you can't minimize the inputs, at least to catch and correct the mistakes before they happen. Um, <clears throat> so rank this kind of quickly, those are field validate, or I'm sorry, field definitions, which is what it sounds like, making sure that when you set something up, you set it up the way that you want it to be so that a person can only enter an information in a certain format. Uh, I often see date fields enter like that are defined as text, which means a person could type 1, 12, 2000, January 12, 2000. They can do it 12, 1, 2000 if you do it the European way, which actually makes more sense to me. But if I define it as, um, you know, month, month, date, date, year, year, then when I try to export that information or analyze it quickly, it's going, it's not going to be a nightmare for me. I can use auto calculations where I could, for instance, auto calculate the age based upon the, um, the date somebody entered. I can even use auto calculations to do some phone formatting when you're trying to look at stuff <clears throat> quickly and like a, if you have to export it, having things be a consistent format is helpful. <clears throat> uh, field validations are rules you create that um, basically don't allow you to submit the form. We're familiar with this. Uh, we've also you can also set up conditional formatting for rules that could potentially be broken. Uh, a number of years ago, I there was an organization and they needed to collect two emergency contacts. That's what they asked for, but they worked with a high poverty um, in, uh, uh, constituency and two emergency contacts was actually difficult. So there was some conditional formatting added so that the form could still be submitted via the online form. <clears throat> but then the staff could see and try to follow up and 
and make sure that all the bases were covered when it came to that, that information. Uh, autofills we're familiar with. So if I type in Greenfield, the system like Google search types in elementary. Um, apart from those things on the left, the stuff on the right is a little, um, is a little more advanced, but actually you're starting to see uh, those things on the right becoming pretty standard. So it's, it's almost like how something will be added to a car it costs extra and then time will go on and now it's just standard. It's kind of the same way when it comes to automated processes. So an example of an automated process is when I type Greenfield Elementary, Greenfield Elementary is not in the system. Would I like to add it? Yes or no? If I select yes, this is what Salesforce does. It opens up a new screen and I enter in that information. I close the screen and then it automatically creates that relationship. If I select no, I can maybe set up an automation that adds a task to the dashboard that says, don't forget to enter Greenfield Elementary into the system and connect it to this record. Um, schedule processes are another thing you find often. And I love schedule processes because they're great at making sure that your data are robust and making sure that it's consistent. And again, just automating things, taking stuff that I'm bad at and putting it onto a system that does it better. And uh, syncs, um, again, it's another thing where you can connect your CRM to another application so that your, your MailChimp, for instance, might uh, be synced up with your campaigns in Salesforce. You can do this through adding an app on, using a third-party connector like Zapier, um, or even like a custom API. And uh, now we come to deployment. And actually this part is fairly short because the big stuff happens on, on the front end, those first two things. When it comes to deployment, putting a CRM into production, this is actually something that's not quite its own distinct phase. Um, I mean, you can, you can think of them as distinct, especially in the beginning, but the fact is, you're kind of always doing deployment, right? If your organization changes and grows, your system is gonna to need to change and grow over time. So when it comes to the deployment process, there are, there are six principles to follow. And again, uh, this is following pretty much always. Principle number one is to set expectations. Make sure, uh, this is all PR, right? So under promise, over deliver, um, make sure people understand there's not a magic wand. This is not gonna fix everything. Um, make sure they understand that those things that they said were, you know, maybe were needed uh, early in the process. Not everything is going to be, you know, not everything requested is going to be provided because one person's request might be another person's nightmare. Make sure they know there's going to be an adjustment period, right? Um, there might be a period of time when you're kind of doing both systems at the same time. You'll transition as quickly as possible, but there is an initial adjustment. There is a period of time where you're going to have to learn something and it's going to take a little bit longer. Make sure they expect it not to be perfect at first. Even huge software companies cannot anticipate every single user behavior. Um, but also make it clear that you are listening and you will continue to listen because people need to feel like they have buy-in on the process. Also use champions. In any organization, there's kind of a breakup this way, uh, I find. I don't have any research to back this up, but I just find that it tends to be true that you have 20% who are really enthusiastic. You have 60% who are interested and could be enthusiastic. And then you just have 20% who aren't gonna be happy with anything when it comes to technology. And that's fine. Um, what you wanna do is focus on the enthusiastic 20%. Those are your champions. Those are your beta testers. Those are your early adopters. And as they start to use the system more, they become the evangelists to help bring on that other 60%. And once you have 80% of the system, people using and being excited about the system, the other 20% that doesn't wanna do it, they have no choice but to start using it anyway. Um, they're also great um, informal trainers, right? If I, I do, I'll put something together and then I'll do a training on it. I'm not going to explain it nearly as well as somebody who's actually using it. I'm not going to use the right words um, and just even have a relationship with somebody will make it easier for them to understand it. This one is phasing deployment. What I mean by that? Um, well, some of you might remember that uh, there was a presentation Bill Gates gave um, right before the release of Windows 98. And uh, you know he was showing how cool it was and what it could do. And then it crashed on stage. Um, there were also whenever like for a number of years, every new version of Windows would be followed by stories about like um, how people couldn't get drivers to work and sometimes had to buy new computers. 
healthcare.gov is the most recent one. Um, the administration, if you don't know, it's how Americans who can't afford insurance buy it anyway, don't get me started. Um, but uh, as the date of launch approached, the administration was really promoting it. And then for weeks, it simply did not work. So um, more lately, what you're seeing is, in, is developers following more of an iterative process. They will release something, they'll get feedback, they'll change it in response to the feedback, and then they'll release it. And then they'll get feedback, and then they'll change the thing in response to feedback, and then they'll release it. It's a constant cycle. Get feedback, change, repeat. That helps to set up realistic expectations, and it also makes users feel invested in the process. You're not releasing a huge system, but um, it's still wise to phase things, especially when you have few resources. So there are three ways to think about this. You could release it part by part, right? So um, starting on this day, whenever a new contact comes in, we are going to enter them into the new CRM, not the old CRM. We've done that for a while. Okay, now we're gonna start tracking our tasks in the new CRM. And you, you keep doing that, adding more of those, those pieces on as you go along. That allows you to work out you know, bugs as they happen versus everything going wrong all at once, which is always easier to, always more difficult to handle that part. You could take a program by program approach if you have very distinct programs in what you do. Um, or you could take a department by department approach. So you can say, we're gonna set up and deploy Salesforce for the development team. And then later as they're using it, um, you know what, we're going to use Salesforce to track campaigns as well. And then later, you know, marketing is making good use of this. Let's, what about our other outreach programs? What about our events? How about event coordinator? You start using Salesforce and you keep, again, adding things. So the transition that way is more manageable. Um, which works best is really situation dependent. There isn't just one answer, right? There we go. Feedback. Uh, this is essential to iterative design. Um, it works again by small phase, listen, adjust, repeat. When I deploy something, I actually, I do put an online form. Sometimes I actually put it in the new system where people can report bugs or request features. I make their requests and reports public within the organizations so that people feel like they're being heard. Um, I so update them, I give them a roadmap because uh, it helps them feel like they're being listened to. It also can keep you know, the organization accountable because at this point you've been doing things for a while and it's very easy to go like, okay, we're done now. You're not done. And then conventions, which are just another word for rules because you might have automation set up, but um, you're still gonna need humans to enter things. So a rule might be households. will always start with the name the and use the first and last name of the primary contact. For example, followed by the word household. So for example, Marge Simpson household could be an action like donations will be acknowledged via email within 48 hours. You need uh, to set those rules. You also need an enforcer to make sure they're followed. Um, ideally, this is going to be somebody who's bright and bubbly uh, and also borderline obsessive compulsive. Somebody who can fire off an email that says like, hey, Tammy, I noticed that you still had some pending tasks and you haven't logged in a while. Uh, just want to make sure everything's okay. If you can't find that, then anybody who doesn't care about being liked will also work. You just need to get it done. And then finally, um, a CRM is like an office fridge. Uh, it is a shared space. And if there's one thing we know about shared spaces, uh, they often are neglected equally by everyone. They get kind of gross. Data management's the same way. So you are going to need to do some maintenance. Um, this is just a suggested uh, timeline of things to do. Um, anything related to finance, do more quickly. Deduping records should happen at least every month. This is, again, it's going to all vary on like the size of the data set that you have and how complex your problems are. The main thing is to have a schedule of when you do things. Uh, and make sure that schedule is followed. The one thing that I say is pretty much firm is that at least once a year, uh, the tech person needs to get in and, and get into the system and make sure everything's still okay, make sure there aren't errors triggered by whatever's been changed over the, the course of the time. Sometimes oh, you really wanna start a bit more aggressive at first, and then as you go along, you can um, uh, you know, adjust the schedule, but do make sure you have a schedule of when things should be done. Otherwise the data gets out of hand. And knowledge is only as powerful as it is truthful. 
Uh, I'm going to skip the conclusion because I have two minutes left, and I am just going to say uh, thank you very much. My name is David Dunn. I'm the principal of Undaunted LLC. I, again, appreciate the opportunity to be here and to speak with all of you. Um, I'm happy to take what questions uh, I can take, but I'm also, um, my email address is, uh, it's in this last slide, which I'll have access to. So do also feel free to email me um, with any questions with what time is remaining, and I can try to respond to those as, as best I can. When I do discovery, I don't charge people. So it's like, I'm not going to be like timing you or whatever. If you have a question about anything, just shoot me an email and, um, you know, I can, I can try to answer that specific question or we can talk about uh, you know, some things that apply to your specific issue. Yeah. I'm Thank done. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. It was really, really very dynamic presentation, super, uh, very practical tips and uh, advice, really well appreciated. Particularly CRM is really part of our professional life, so it's really crucial to, to get this helpful support. Um, yeah, we indeed have uh, maybe a few minutes to to have uh, to answer some questions. So if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask right now but in any case of course uh, david is there to follow up afterwards yes please alex yes uh david i know you said you don't recommend any products in particular but i've been mucking around with notion and also um Airtable, and i just wanted your quick thoughts on them as potentially um crm any limitations or opportunities there i'm not immediately familiar with notion um i think i've I, it's, I've used it. I've seen it. I, it's not coming to mind. Um, Airtable, I see used more. Airtable is is quickly becoming like uh, one of the nicer low code um, or no code um, uh, data management systems. Uh, I like Airtable if you like maybe like maybe you can't find that ninety five percent of your needs met in like a bigger system yet. Uh, it, if nothing else, it is a good transitionary system, right? It is better. Um, if you're like getting to the point where spreadsheets are too hard, Airtable works pretty well because you can set up those links the, between um, uh, between the different uh, data entities that you have. So I do like Airtable. Um, you know, it can be a time suck because it is a managed system. So again, it's like all about how you set it up and setting it up properly. Um, that's when the that design, those structural considerations become really important. But if you can get that right, Airtable is a good option. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? I'm sure you would uh, need some time to digest all the all the information and to rewatch the video as well. More questions will be uh, coming along, and then, of course, it's not necessary to ask questions during the session. I'm sure you have more precise questions which require more like attention from David. So, as I mentioned earlier, and as David also mentioned, please uh, feel free to contact him. I will send you the follow up email uh, to share the materials uh, from David and also information about his uh, uh, services. And uh, so we will also have uh, some one-to-one -one consultations available, which already I'm going to book uh, with David uh, right after the session. So uh, on this note, I will just uh, say to David a very, very big thank you. It was really, really a super comprehensive uh, presentation. And really thank you for sharing your, your big knowledge and experience with us. And we'll be in touch. And thank you, everyone, for, for attending. Thank you so much. Yeah. Ah, we have a question, actually, from Ari. Oh, more than happy. Yeah. Yes, please, Ari. Hey, uh, my name is Ari. Uh, so we are three people here, myself and my colleague Ajang, and uh, the other colleague is Ega. Oh, she's here. So uh, what, just one question. Uh, we are not uh, actually uh, uh, Nonprofit. Uh, we are not an NGO. Uh, uh, in short, we are more like uh, doing uh, advisory and consultancy. So uh, I'm happy with your explanation, uh, but I don't know how I can use it in my field. But I did one uh, study where I uh, I asked for survey. So my question is quick: uh, Is CRM useful? If I only need it to analyze a survey or like a food, so um, uh, or a CRM is only useful if I uh, uh, repeatedly doing uh, using it uh, like every day. Uh, so yeah, that, 
Uh, if I had a serve and when I do surveys, I don't use a CRM for that. Again, like, do I need to track it? Do I need to count it? Um, you know, I need to count the results of the survey itself, but I don't need to count the results yes. necessarily from, you know, another person, especially if it's an anonymous survey. Um, yeah. Forms you might want to do in terms of marketing, like if you're marketing, you can have yeah. a form that's somehow connected to a user that can be really helpful. But no, for surveys, I'm spreadsheet. Spreadsheets are great. Like they're great for mm. you know, occasional cases. I use them. This is yes. really about everyday so, uh, Thanks, thanks. That's clear. Because my experience with what I did uh, last year was that I got the data and then I got overwhelmed by that data. Mm. What is the relations between this and that? I, I could not analyze it. So uh, I, I thought that using CRM could help me. But if you think uh, CRM is more for uh, repeated tasks, like daily tasks, okay, then I, I cannot use CRM anyway. Uh, I think I still uh, need spreadsheet. So, so I will say for data analysis stuff, um, data is hard. Actually, like pulling in somebody who's a, uh, who does stats and quants, uh, statistics and quantitative uh, analysis is really helpful. They can just, it, it, I'm overwhelmed by data. Um, I do, um, I do actually, I have my own rapid app stuff. And so when I'm working with data, I often will actually build a very light CRM or a light relational um, database. You could actually use Airtable yes, for that. Yes, yes. Um, and, and I can kind of group things and see those, those things a little bit easier. Um, so any way uh, you can kind of group the data can be helpful. Uh, what's the name of that uh, tools? For me, it's, um, I use FileMaker. Um, uh, that's where kind of where I got my start. And I, I do a lot of work in there, um, but I, I'll quickly what, build an app in like a few minutes. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, what was that? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, if you can file maker, it. File maker by file Claris. Maker. Mm -hmm. It's one of the older, um, uh, most used um, low code apps out there. Is it like file maker like this that I write on the chat box? Um, I'm not, I'm sorry, I can't see, but it's uh, oh, okay. capital. Yeah, I can't see it. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. okay. Okay, thanks, then. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much, David. Uh, and we have uh, one more question from uh, Julia. Yes, please, Julia. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, you can just briefly touch on what is the difference between a CRMR system and using something like pivot tables, for example. Like, is it because it allows you more capability or? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, like, if you're like, Sorry, are you asking me to say more between like using these connections, a CRM versus just having one like list? Yeah, so um, the way I've sort of done, not exactly what you were explaining, so I'm just trying to make sure that I grasp um, exactly what I may not be able to do now that I may want to do. Um, I've been using pivot tables, for example, within Excel or like Google Sheets okay, yeah. to sort of see relations between data so i was just wondering you know is cm are like a step further or is it like something different that allows like you know different sort of capabilities or i just want to make sure i understand probably yeah um anything you can do in a spreadsheet um like a, a, a crm can do anything you can do in a spreadsheet um it can sometimes do a little bit more if you have automations and that kind of thing but like in a spreadsheet now, right? Like I can actually like tell a cell to refer to another sheet or another, you know, document entirely. I can do that. Uh, it takes more time. So again, it's like the, the 10 minute rule. Is it taking me more than 10 minutes to get what I need? Uh, if so, then maybe I need to think about a, a different way of doing it. Maybe I need to think about a different system. But yeah, I, I do that all the time. Um, the, the use case I mentioned where the person needed to uh, collect Google form data and they were doing a lot of data entry. That was, I use that exact method, right? Get the info, put it over here, then have another sheet sheet it this way. Yeah. One is the foundation of the other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, David, for answering the questions. I think uh, we're done with questions for today. As I mentioned, of course, uh, you'll have more, so feel free to get back to David. And then on this note, uh, thank you so much, David. Thank you, everybody, for Pleasure. joining. Yeah, and uh, having a nice, <laughs> wish you a nice day or whatever part of the day you're in. <laughs> yeah, ciao, bye-bye. Bye-bye.